I live in Bristol, England, and uh, the River Severn separates England from Wales, and this is a phenomenon that occurs there. So here we are now, and here I am, and uh, let's zoom in to where I am. There's uh, the uh, UK, and uh, this is Bristol, and there's the River Severn, and I zoom in a bit more. That's a couple of miles uh, on the top here, and uh, this is where the phenomenon occurs. A few times a year, when there's a high tide in the Atlantic, Instead of coming gradually in and gradually out like the tides on the seashore, this tide can come in as a breaking wave. And there's beautiful physics behind that, which I'll explain. First, you have to know why there are two tides each day. You know that the moon pulls the Earth's water. So you might think there's just one on the side where the moon is, but no. Here's the Earth, here's the moon. And there's a force that the moon exerts on the Earth. A little wobble as the Earth moves around the sun caused by the moon, uh, force on the earth, and uh, the forces on the water are greater on the moon side than the force on the solid earth, and the force on the water on the other side is l uh, less than the force on the solid earth because the, the water there is farther away. Now, the earth is not held in space like a, by a gigantic vice. It's free to move in a way determined by this force on the solid earth, so what raises the tide is the difference between these forces. And these, this difference is the tide-raising force. And it's, if you think about it a little bit with these arrows, it's always outwards. So there are two tidal bulges, simplifying very greatly. And as the Earth rotates, any point on the Earth passes twice under these bulges. And that they're the two tides per day, roughly speaking. Now, you might think, well, why the moon? I mean, the sun is so much bigger. We go around the sun. We don't go around the moon. But the point is this. The gravity from the sun is much greater. But this tide-raising force, which is the difference of gravities, is not. It's not that much smaller than the moon. It's about half as big, which makes the tides complicated, depending on exactly where the moon is and the, in relative to the sun when you have the high tide. So uh, you, tides are complicated astronomically. OK, that's one thing. So there are tides. But why a breaking wave? You need to understand waves. The waves you see breaking on the seashore are waves caused by the wind in, in the far out in the, in, in the ocean, not the tides. But uh, still, why did they break? The wave, uh, this one, uh, this Severn bore, the wave gets steeper as the river gets shallower and narrower. Now, why is that? It's because the speed of waves on water is limited by the depth. The greater the depth, the faster the uh, waves. But think about it this way. The top of a wave, the crest, is in deeper water than the trough. And so it moves faster and eventually overtakes. This is a poor person's simple explanation of something much more complicated called nonlinearity. But that's the reason. So when the w water gets shallow enough, if it goes on for long enough, as it does on this river, which is 100 miles or so from the ocean up to where we see this effect, then the wave can break and the bore comes in as a breaking wave. It's a bit like this. Here, here's a sideways picture. There's a river flowing down about 50 kilometers. And here's the water when the tide comes in at a given instant. So here's the bore, the front. And it's only the beginning of the tide. The tide comes in more and more and more. And uh, you see from this that uh, here the river is flowing, of course, downhill, but upstream. The river flows backwards. Very dramatic thing. So here's uh, some pictures. Um, it's a lovely phenomenon. I often go to see it and I work out from the tide tables each year when it's going to happen. I take people who happen to visit Bristol another 30 miles or so uh, to see it and it's especially beautiful at night because you hear it long before you actually see it. But the biggest tidal bore in the world, which I had the privilege of seeing uh, uh, last year, is in China. It's near Shanghai, it's on the Kiantang River and uh, I went specially to, uh, to, to, to see it. You see it over a period of a few days and nights. And here it is, you see. Here are these people, and here's the boar. And uh, here it is coming past. You see, it's a very dramatic thing. Uh, and, and here you see comparison with the people. There they are, way up there. Um, and uh, I, I've got a little, I hope it works. I've got a little movie here. There we are. Now, the water comes in, and although you won't see it, it it fills this structure up to about here when it comes by. You won't see that, but I'm telling you. It's a very dramatic thing. 100,000 people lining the banks at this biggest one of the year. 
Um, everyone's excited. As I say, we saw it six times. It was, it was a very uh, helpful person who knew the exact times when it would come. You can't actually predict it exactly. It's not like an eclipse. You can predict it to about half an hour. It depends how much water is in the river already, how much wind there is in the open ocean. But here it comes. Here it goes. Everybody's very happy. Now there was one on the River Seine, a place called Côte de Bec, called Le Masqueret. There's a, a possibly fanciful, I'm not sure, uh, engraving of it, but it was destroyed by some works which dredged out the bottom of the river for navigational purposes, and it no longer occurs. Now what's the principle behind this? In physics, what we dream of doing is something called unification connecting different phenomena, uh, as wide an explanatory range as possible. For example, Maxwell, that was a great moment of uni unification when he taught us that uh, electricity, magnetism, light are all exemplifications of the same phenomenon. But before him, it was Isaac Newton who gave the first unification and showing that the force that holds us to the ground, the force that holds the moon in its orbit, and the force that raises the tides are all exactly the same force. And when you see this uh, uh, phenomenon, you really believe, you really see this unification. I found students, uh, take students to see it, they believe physics when this is predicted and then when it comes, it's often late, you know, half an hour I said, you get there early, you don't want to miss it. They, is this ever going to come? Is the river quietly flowing down? But then when it does come, the river flows backwards, they think, oh, maybe you believe physics after all. <laughs> okay, second one. Here's uh, a rainbow, and I want to draw your attention to this little line in here. I think uh, you can see it, can't you? This little line inside the main, uh, not the second bow, that's a different thing. That's way out here. This little line here. Um, well, that's uh, called a supernumerary rainbow. Supernumerary means surplus to requirements, unwanted. Began to be observed and noted a few years after Newton died and people didn't know what to make of it. But you have to understand how a rainbow forms at all. Why is there this arc in the sky? Well, Descartes understood that. The main question, why is there an arc? Then the colours Newton explained, the water uh, refracts sunlight a bit differently. But here it is. Here's what Descartes uh, taught us. Um, sunlight comes in uniformly into the drop, refraction, reflection, whatever. But it comes out actually concentrated near a particular angle. You have to imagine rotating this picture about this axis, because it's a sphere, not a disc. So this is a, becomes a bright cone of light. Every raindrop sends out a bright cone of light, and you, on the ground, looking up, see all the bright cones on uh, which, all the raindrops on whose cones our eyes lie. You think about it a bit, that's an arc in the sky. Now, well, very good, but it doesn't explain these supernumerary rainbows. That had to wait a century after Newton died, when Thomas Young taught us that uh, light is waves. Now, waves can interfere with each other. Um, you know that you have two waves, here they are. They could add, you get constructive, or they can, uh, uh, they can cancel, destructive. One plus one can equal zero for intensities of, uh, of light. Now, so one plus one isn't always two for the algebra of intensities in, uh, in waves. What does that mean for rainbow? Well, uh, here's, a, 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 here's one where you see many more of these interferences. The two waves that emerge from a rainbow in any direction inside the bow, you see here are two different rays, but they come out in the same direction, um, can interfere in or out of phase depending on direction. And uh, these, this gives rise to interference fringes, which you see only when all the raindrops are of similar size. That depends on meteorology. Otherwise, the fringes blur each other out. That's something called decoherence. That's another thing. But uh, you can, about a third of the time, you can see one or two of these. This is rather exceptional to see so many. So why did I show you this not very convincing picture where you just see one? Because this is an iconic picture, actually. Uh, why? 
because it shows a rainbow over the house where Newton was born. There it is. But it's also ironic as well as iconic because, you know, he couldn't understand this. So what's the message? It's a tiny effect. You see it in the sky, you don't notice it for a long time, but it shows one physical theory, ray optics, being superseded by a fundamentally deeper one, which is wave optics. It often happens when there's a revolution in physics and something uh, is revealed as being an approximation and you get some new theory which is better. It's a tiny effect that, uh, that, uh, that shows it. And here, looking up, you see this uh, directly. So this is the, uh, the second of mine. Um, the third one, chosen specifically because of where we are now, where you are. How many of you have heard of the green flash? Wonderful. How many of you have seen it? Just a, a few. Lucky you. I've looked hundreds of times. I've seen it twice, uh, once in uh, South Australia and, uh, and once in, in Corsica. Um, I looked, I last time I was here, I stayed in Laguna Beach and my room looked out on the air. I arranged to be in the room at sunset every one of the four or five nights I was here and I didn't see it. You see this. So you see the sun going down, red, because the blue in the sunlight has gone out to make the blue sky. It hits the horizon, it has to be clear horizon of course, which again you don't always have. Down, 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 down. And the last rays flash out a brilliant green gleam. I don't know if you'll be able to see this movie. It was sent to me. Let, let's see. You have to look extremely carefully. Don't, don't you look very carefully. The sun is setting, setting. There'll be a little green momentary gleam in... Now, there. I, if I magnify that to clip, it's that. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a rather beautiful thing to see. Now, what is it and why am I telling you? See, there's the Earth, and there's the Earth's air, exaggerated, of course. The atmosphere is a huge lens made of air. The whole world air is a lens made of air, which bends light. Light is bent towards the denser medium. Here's the sun coming, light is bent. So when you see the sunset, it's actually already set uh, a few minutes ago. It's refraction bending, lifts the sun up by about half a degree. That's about its own size, so that's the, that's the scale of it. Now, this phenomenon is slightly different for the different colours because the refraction in air depends on the colour, depends on the wavelength. And the green is bent more than the red. So here's the picture you should see when you look. Here uh, you see uh, the red sun and just above it the green sun. Now, uh, what about the blue light? It's gone to make the blue sky, you don't see that. So the red sun, the green sun, is lifted slightly by such a small amount, you can't look at the sun and see a green rim, it's only a few seconds of arc, but when the red sun has set, just for a moment, uh, there is this uh, green gleam, if you're lucky, if the air is very still, whatever. Okay, um, but by the way, the people who established this explanation in the 1950s, there were rival explanations, were the Pope's astronomers in the Papal Observatory in Castel Gandolfo in Italy, where you can see this effect at sunset and also at sunrise on, in, in the opposite direction. Um, so there it is. And what am I, why am I telling you this? It's because it's ordinary physics, the same optics that you have in the colour distortion when you look through cheap binoculars and, and, uh, and, and, and badly made uh, uh, lenses, but uh, on, on a vast scale, unfamiliar scale of the Earth. So uh, the laws of physics apply on many different scales and this is the whole Earth acting as a lens. By the way, there's a bad romantic novel by Jules Verne about this, The Green Flash, Le Rayon Vert. And there's a bad romantic uh, film by Eric Roma with the same title, with a horribly synthesized green flash at the end. It's very artificial <laughs> graphics. In there they repeat this legend. Whoever has seen the green flash will never again make a mistake in matters of the heart. I can tell you it's not true. <laughs> Fourth one, quantum physics and the compact disc player. Um, here's a CD, CD invented in 1982. What is it? It's a four mile spiral of music encoded as bumps and pits on the surface. The heart of it is how to read these bumps and pits, and there's a laser in there, invented in 1958. Now, 
and, and, and what the laser does, it, uh, it, 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 by interference it records the bumps and pits which are converted to electricity and then into sound eventually and you can hear. Good. Now how does that work? Well that works because of a principle called stimulated emission which Einstein had discovered 40 years before as part of the work which eventually led to the full quantum mechanics a decade later. Now what's that? Well, it's, uh, you, you have uh, an electron in some excited state and a photon comes along and stimulates that electron to move to a lower level, thereby emitting another photon. So you've now got two and they're in phase, they're coherent and this continues to in a chain reaction, you get a cascade. That's at the heart of the laser, the pure, beautiful, bright light. Okay, now why am I telling you this? It's unimaginable in 1917 by Einstein that 40 years later physicists with a different type of mentality would use it to create the purest, brightest light laser. He didn't envisage this and as I say it's a different type of mentality. Similarly, those physicists who invented the laser didn't imagine that uh, in 1982 engineers would use the uh, uh, laser to make music. Again, a different type of mentality. I remember um, um, when in the 60s when we first, lear first learned as students about these wonderful things called lasers. People called them an invention looking for an application. <laughs> you know, every supermarket checkout has uh, 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 so many applications now. But I want to talk about this one. You see, first of all, the world is connected in strange ways. I give a whole lecture on this subject. You see, it's not just physics, it's engineering, it's mathematics. The coding of the, uh, of the way in which the, the pits are made and read so that uh, the sound is in pretty invulnerable against uh, dust and scratches and the like is very subtle, very subtle mathematical coding is used. Of course, you need business, you need business people, it needs to be manufactured, you need finance, you need to be advertised, of course you need music, otherwise what's the point? So the world is connected in very strange ways, but my point is that the CD player is a quantum physics machine. Now, why am I mentioning the CD player? Because this was the first device which enabled ordinary people to hear essentially perfectly reproduced music anywhere in the world. You had the radio before, but then you couldn't choose what to hear. You had the gramophone, awkward thing to carry around if you're up a mountain. Um, you, you had the, uh, the CD, the Walkman, with the tape. Well, that was, that was a, a, a good thing, but uh, on the other hand, it was awkward to find the place on the tape where you wanted a particular you know, um, uh, song. Whereas with the CD play, you had complete control. Now, of course, you have MP3s. It's different again. But still, with the CD play, it was the first. <coughs> Therefore, and this is a message that I think um, many people, especially in public life, who run our public life, I mean politicians should know, quantum physics has democratized music. <laughs> Everyone should know. In much the same way that my Bristol neighbour, almost, Henry Fox Talbot, in the 1830s, invented photography, I mean the photographic negative that enables one negative to produce very many pictures, used chemistry and optics to democratise the image. People could then see reproduced sites and and uh, uh, pictures that they otherwise would have to travel somewhere to see. So this happens again and again, but here it is. Quantum physics has democratized music. And here's my final wonder. I say there are many more. Um, why is gold golden? You know, this color has fascinated humanity for thousands of years. Um, gold. Well, what does colour come from? It's the light that's reflected by surfaces, the light that's not absorbed. Okay, in the case of gold, white light comes in and sort of yellow plus shiny comes out, that's gold. All the other light's absorbed. As physicists, if you want to understand this phenomenon, we have to look into the details. Well, what do the details involve? Light is absorbed if it interacts strongly with the electrons in the crystal structure of the metal in this case. Well, that's physics, and uh, it's quantum physics. Um, uh, uh, it's not easy. You can't just scribble on the back of an envelope to find this. It requires mathematics, a long and detailed computation based on uh, quantum mechanics, physics of the small, using uh, Schrodinger's equation. You've all heard of it, if you're not scientists. 
Well, that wasn't done till the 1990s, and uh, the calculation was done, and the colour that came out was silver. <laughs> so, it was a mistake. Okay, something was left out, as you know, that's what physics is. You compare, you make mistakes, mostly good to make mistakes. I mean, the point about physics is that what the philosophers call the example of fallibilism. You're proud to get things wrong because you learn from them, instead of being trying to pretend you didn't. Well, what they missed out was the fact that gold is a heavy metal, and the electrons move fast, and they move so fast that you have to use Einstein's relativity, physics of the fast, to, uh, uh, in the theory, in the quantum theory. Well, that, that's not Schrodinger's equation. It's something different. It's Dirac's equation. The Dirac equation incorporates this kind of relativity into quantum physics, and that's a calculation. And uh, around about that time, people began to do Dirac equation solid-state physics for heavy uh, metals, um, heavy materials. And at last, the predicted color comes out right. Uh, good. So what do we learn? We learn that gold is relativistic silver, okay? <laughs> and we learn this is a very unexpected, everyday influence of uh, physics of the fast and the small, which are the two great revolutions of the 20th century, quantum mechanics and relativity. You need both of those to understand this color. Now, I, I spoke about this for a while, and when I was in India, somebody pointed me to a quite recent paper, a couple of years ago, in Physical Review Letters, with a similar example, and it's your car battery. The lead-acid battery in your car works because of complicated electrochemical processes, and it was invented uh, by trial and error. To, but of course, there, some of those processes are quantum processes. They're very difficult, and some quantum chemists had actually calculated the voltage you would get in a lead-acid battery from first principles of a hard calculation. And what they come up with is this fact. You have to include relativity, and if you don't, your lead-acid battery would only give you about 10% of the voltage. That's why you don't have a tin-acid battery. Tin is lighter. Now, so every time you start your car, I mean, your car wouldn't start, sorry, if you didn't have relativity. Every time you start your car with the battery, you're using uh, uh, relativity. It's a, it's a curious thing, but uh, worth knowing. That's all I want to tell you. Finish now. <laughs>